coming up. Sharp shooting from a 200 million pixel mega camera. A monster airbag that can catch a car. And jelly beans by the billion. How do they do it? It's one of the most famous phrases ever uttered. And it's even cooler with pictures. If you're going to go where no human has ever gone before, and if you're going to take some of the most important photographs in history, you're going to want a really good camera. The Apollo 11 mission was shot with one of the most advanced cameras of its day. And the company that made it still build cameras that are out of this world. How do they do it? The first ever photograph was taken by Joseph Nisifor Nieps. It's a view of his estate in France, taken from an upstairs window. And it's almost impossible to make anything out. But this was 1826. Things have come on a bit since then. For a start, most cameras now take digital images. These are made up of thousands of blocks of colour, called pixels, each about 1 20th the width of a human hair. And today, it's possible to turn a photograph of digital pixels into a giant advertising image that stays super sharp when stretched across 10 stories. But that calls for a bit more than a camera phone. Hasselblad in Gothenburg, Sweden, have been making cutting-edge cameras since the 1940s. When founder Victor Hasselblad created the first aerial surveillance camera for the Swedish Air Force. And like their kit, product manager Ove Bengtsson never lies. This camera was the one that Buzz Aldrin and used on his spacesuit to take pictures of Neil Armstrong. So maybe the most famous camera ever made. Not every camera that was sent into space made it back. In fact, there are still 12 Hasselblad cameras on the surface of the moon. They left them there to make space for the rock samples that they brought back. I've just got this mental image of an alien landing on the moon and being really confused because there's nothing there except these 12 cameras. Buzz's film camera is a bit last century. The company's latest digital model wouldn't look out of place around the neck of Captain Kirk. It takes photos that are 28 times the digital resolution of most point-and-shoot models. Let's put this into perspective. The resolution from a high-end camera phone is 8 million pixels, which sounds like a lot. But the resolution from a Hasselblad camera is over 200 million pixels. This mega, megapixel camera is formed from hundreds of parts. But the secret to its performance is a tiny motor that moves the camera sensor as little as half a pixel between shots. The camera takes six successive shots, then combines them to produce a single image. This means that unlike other cameras, it can capture more than one colour in each pixel. And it produces a level of detail that will blow your mind. The camera motor is built from lightweight, non-corrosive aluminium. Liquid-cooled drills carve out the contours and details of each component with microscopic accuracy. Then the pieces pass to Ulf Leonardson to assemble the complex jigsaw that makes up a motor. With such a microscopic movement, testing Ulf's handiwork is a major challenge which is met with a big pin. Poking something resembling a knitting needle into something so high-tech might look like vandalism, but there's method in Ulf's madness. If the motor inside is ticking over properly, the pin amplifies that movement and the tip twitches. Yeah, it's working fine. As you can see on the knob, it's moving. Next, to attach the minuscule motor to the camera's image sensor. This records visual information through millions of tiny pixels. 
This model uses one of the largest image sensors in the world. It generates over 50 million pixels, more than 25 times the number in an HD television. The camera combines the different colour images it captures to create a stunning 200 million pixel resolution. The price is also sharp enough to make you wince. $40,000. That's nothing compared to the most expensive camera ever sold. A German camera made in 1923 sold 89 years later for $2.8 million. That's a lot. When you're making a camera that costs more than many people earn in a year, it pays to protect it. So Hasselblad turns to metal workers SEPA to create an unbreakable case. They start with 0.8mm thick discs of toughened steel, which they lubricate to reduce friction and feed into an almighty press. This monster punches out the basic camera case with 300 tonnes of force. Then a laser finishes off the fine detail and the camera shell passes to the assembly line. Here, workers add components like the mirror and the shutter curtain. This snaps open when you take a shot, letting light onto the camera's sensor. The word photography comes from the Greek word phos, meaning light, and grapho, meaning to write. In fact, in the 1830s, early photographs were known as sun pictures. With the controls fitted, the camera is ready for its close-up. In the world's weirdest photographic studio. From a cartoon character to a geisha girl, every object in here has been carefully chosen to reveal different technical issues with the camera. And after passing with breathtakingly vivid flying colours, the multi-shot is ready for a bigger assignment. Across town, photographer Arna Edstrom is preparing to photograph one of Sweden's biggest models. The Volvo FH16. She's a beauty. And with the stage set, it's lights, camera, shoot. It's perfect. I think it's a wrap. The 200 million pixel shot is in the bag. And remarkably, you can zoom in 100%, even 200%, and pick out the tiniest detail with no pixelation or degradation. It's an incredible image. But if you want to appreciate how incredible, you'll need to wait for them to invent a better TV. Still to come. Catching mayhem with a monster mega airbag. And sweet as candy, making billions of juicy jelly beans. How do they do it? You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. If you've ever fancied doing this, or this, but you're worried you might end up like this. There is a way. Before airbags, stupid stunts were very, very dangerous. Evil Knievel suffered 400 odd fractures before he traded in his motorbike for a push bike. We can't seem to stop ourselves from trying stupid stunts. Free climbing the tallest buildings jumping the Grand Canyon on a motorbike, tightrope walking between two hot air balloons. Luckily, there's now something that will allow you to try some of these without getting too badly hurt. Making something strong enough and big enough to handle the impact of anything from a grown man to a stripped down car isn't easy. How do they do it? The Netherlands. A land of windmills and windbags. Here in Heerenveen, the big airbag company have been making safety bags for the extreme sports industry for 10 years. Their giant airbags can be as big as 400 square metres, allowing athletes and thrill seekers to break in their skills without breaking their necks. 
The company was set up by a pair of snowboard freestylers. When designer Arjun Gitzmar started out, making these airbags was a long-winded process. 15 years ago, we had to hand cut all these pieces. Nowadays, we just use a can. There's a lot of parts, over 65 of them. The process starts with Rob Mulder on the computerized cutting machine. He cuts out shapes in toughened PVC. The machine can cut to an accuracy of 0.01 millimeters. And yes, you're right, he's cutting holes. Because this airbag is not pressurized. Air is always going in and out. If airbags were pressurized, people falling from heights would simply bounce off the bag which would look hilarious, but would not be very safe. To slowly cushion the landing, you've got to vary the pressure. Multiple adjustable windows allow air to be forced out at high speed when a daredevil smashes into the bag. That way, they sink down to safety rather than bouncing off into oblivion. Once the PVC is cut, it's taken to the high-frequency microwave welding room. This is a bit weird, because you think of a microwave as something you use to heat your dinner, whereas welding uses intense heat and showers of sparks. So actually using a microwave to weld stuff together is pretty cool. This machine can fuse together pieces of PVC in under six seconds without a spark in sight. Because we're welding it, it's airtight and it's much stronger. It's even watertight. Welded seams are super strong, and they're used on the parts of the airbag that take the hardest hammering. Everything else is done with a needle and thread. Once Benny and Ralph have welded the strips into one airtight piece, it's sent to the sewing room for the extra essentials to be added on. From the straps and rings that hold it in place, to the housing for the twin air pumps, which keep the bag inflated. The material is then moved to the assembly platform. There are 65 pieces. It's like a big puzzle. We use a lot of stitches here because uh, the guys who are using it, they do really mad things with it. Big airbags were invented by a guy who worked for NASA called John Skurlock. He came up with the idea when he was trying to make inflatable tennis court covers. He also invented bouncy castles. With the welding and sewing complete, it's then time to inflate the airbag to operational size. To do that, they close all the air windows and fire up the pumps. There are two blowers and it takes approximately five minutes to blow up. And with that, the airbag is ready to be shipped out to crackpots worldwide. You're up, maniacs. The jelly bean. A sweet treat in the shape of a bean. This day-glow delight has been loved by kids and adults for over 150 years. We think of jelly beans with their bright colours and crazy flavours as coming from some kind of Willy Wonka sweet factory. But they've actually been around since the 19th century. In fact, the makers of jelly beans sent them to Union soldiers fighting in the American Civil War. The question is, could they have won without them? They come in a hundred different flavours and every colour of the candy rainbow. How do they do it? Welcome to Candyland. Or Fairfield, California, if you're going to quibble. You don't need to be sweet to work here, but it helps. We eat over 15 billion jelly beans a year, and that's enough to go around the world five and a half times. This factory alone produces over 16,000 tons of jelly beans a year. Flavors range from berry cherry to champagne, and new ones are added all the time. These new flavours are born in the lab, and Jeff Brown has helped deliver his fair share of bouncing baby beans. Whenever we come up with an idea, whether it's a lemon or a peach, we will actually sit down as a group and we'll take a look at that. We'll try the real thing, and then we'll just start the process of making 
that identical flavor on a jelly bean. Most flavors are inspired by favorites like marshmallow or strawberry cheesecake. But occasionally, for Halloween or special editions, they produce more wicked sounding flavors. We'll make flavors such as skunk, uh, dirt, vomit, booger. If you can think about something disgusting, we can try to perfect it into a jelly bean. Whether it's skunk, vomit, or something unthinkable like strawberry, each bean begins with a slurry made from cornstarch, corn syrup, sugar, and water. We sure do love sugar. An average American eats 60 kilograms of sugar every year. That's 130 pounds. Richly condensed flavors are blended to form the base mix, which is pumped downstairs to the mogul machine. Invented over a hundred years ago, this massive mechanical multitasker creates thousands of candy molds at a time. Because it's the master of so many jobs, the original manufacturers called it the mogul. To stop the gummy slurry sticking to the molds, they need to be made from a non-stick material. The simple solution is cornstarch, which is poured into wooden frames. The mogul then stamps the shape of a bean into the non-stick powder to create the mold. These mogul machines had a massive impact on how we produce candy, and it was getting cheaper. The first penny candy was the Tootsie Roll, which first appeared in 1896. They still sell over 60 million of them every day, although they cost a little bit more than a penny these days. Each tray contains 1,260 individual molds. As the trays pass towards the sweet center of the factory, a bank of nozzles rises and falls, pumping in the slurry mixed earlier. Each one of these tiny molds contains just the soft center. The shiny outer shell is made further down the line. The filled trays are now stacked and sent to the dry room to cool and cure overnight. Last night's batch goes back into the mogul, which tips them up and sends them off down the line. The trouble is, the jellies could still stick together. So first, they get a steam shower to moisten them. Then it's a majestic leap through a sugar waterfall. The sugar sticks to the moist jelly and acts as a primer coat. This prevents the batch of tiny jelly centers turning into a massive sticky lump. At this stage, they're nothing more than chewy jelly. To build them up, they head to the panning department. It looks like the biggest building site on Earth. But they're not mixing cement. They're mixing a six-year-old's dreams and a dentist's nightmares. As the different centers tumble in these spinning kettle drums, it's time to add some color. And there's nothing subtle about this primary colored palette. Over the course of two hours, flavored syrup and sugar are alternated, slowly building around the center, creating the multi-layered outer shell. And as factory manager Danny Williams explains, the magic is all done by hand and eye. Some people say that when we're panning the beans, it's an art form. I prefer to think of it as it's an experience, it's a feel, it's a candy maker kind of thing. And all of these guys, depending on humidity, conditions, the candy and how the candy reacts, they have to be able to recognize the candy in its different steps to make sure that we're getting the quality that we want. The challenge now is to get that all-important sheen on every bean. So the candy men send them to the finishing room. 200 kilo batches are spun in more giant drums, ready for the secret shiny ingredient. Beeswax. 
Amazingly, they shine your beans with the same stuff they use to polish tables. So bees have special glands on their abdomen that turn sugar into wax. It doesn't change the taste, but it makes the candy look great. The beans are then left to rest and firm up, ready for the final leg. Like men, not all beans are created equal. And the losers are wheedled out. First, a robot dumps the beans into massive rotating drums. A specially designed mesh allows only the right size beans to fall through. Then the wanna beans are inspected by eye. Those that don't measure up are rejected and separated out. These sorry has beans are known as belly flops and they're sold separately in the factory store. The lucky winners are sent to the printing press. As they fall into a special tray, they pass under a set of rollers, which prints the jelly bean name on every single one. Each roller can print a staggering 20,700 beans per minute. Each flavour is processed individually, but for those who can't pick a favourite, there's the mixing line. Different batches are laid on a conveyor like a jelly bean rainbow and deposited in this giant mixer. As the beans swirl around, they're mixed into a cocktail of flavours and colours. And at the end of the rainbow is the bagging machine. Empty bags are fed through a system of rollers and 100 grams of jelly beans are deposited in each one. The bags are sealed and sent off down the line. Lying in wait is a trio of frantic robot arms who look like they've had enough sugar already. Once the robo bean pickers have packed them into boxes, they're loaded onto trucks and shipped off, ready to be chewed up around the world.